you just think we just, you know, whatever happens, we just shit another player. I, and everything's going to be perfect. All of our fans think that. You all think that. That's what you write about. You don't want to be here. There's a specific reason. Not really, you know, I, I think we did a poor job recruiting. If guys are coming in and immediately walking out the door because it was something different than what they thought it would be. And we lied to them during recruiting or we, we sold them on a dream that wasn't true. Yeah, you know, right now uh, we have the atmosphere of a, of a JC softball game. You know, I mean, that's what we are, JC softball team. As long as, you know, uh, it's 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 not whether you win or lose. It's like who, the, the 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 team that wins is the one that has the most fun. You know that crap like that. You know all this stuff that's contaminated America, where they give every kid a trophy and they don't keep scoring in little league anymore. Now that's also it's second in the West, baby. Yes, sir. <laughs> excited about second. From now on, it's first, okay? Winning the SEC probably is harder than winning the national championship. Do you know that? Well, how about the fucking dogs? <laughs> my <laughs> my hey, 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 hey! Turn that down, you boss! Hey, 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 buddy, this beer's for you, Mike, and Cousin Shane. That SEC podcast loves the Pirate, and the Pirate loves that SEC podcast. Hail State. Welcome in the latest episode of That SEC Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Bratton. I go by SEC Michael Twitter, and I'm joined, as always, by my cousin Shane, who goes by Big Orange Vols on Twitter. What are you up to, you big Tennessee homer? Hey, buddy, what's going on? Oh, man, alive. We got a great show lined up here. We got a guest coming on the line, one of my favorite people covering the SEC and one of the best Twitter followers out there, SEC Stat Cat, Clark Brooks, SEC Stat Cat, dropping some knowledge. So looking forward to that, buddy. How you doing? Oh, man, I'm doing great, brother. Just I've been waiting. We were talking before the show, and I'm looking at this beer, and I'm like, "Golly, Mike, I'm, gonna, I'm ready to tap into this thing. Let's get this party started." So, uh, yeah, man, I love it. You know this. This is the this is the season, man. You know, you 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 threw out a list on yesterday. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, it's least se- it's list season. It's it's uh, we're talking about what ifs, and it's that's a fun time of the year too. So uh, I'm I'm embracing it. I'm ready to talk about it. I'm looking forward to the interview you got coming on. Sometimes I remember last time he was on, man. I you ever seen that scene in Hangover when he's out there at the casino and all those numbers <laughs> and diagrams are floating around? Sometimes when the stat kick gets going, man, it's just like that's me. I get kind of lost there in the matrix, but uh, I, I'm glad he's doing the numbers because if I was in charge of that, I wouldn't be able. I mean, we'd be in rough shape, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Well, your references there the on the last podcast. If you missed it, go ahead, go back and check that out. But uh, I broke down the transfer portal impact rankings, and uh, you know I don't want to go over the whole list here. We just did a whole podcast on it, but I do want to make a note. Total omission on my part. I plead on the mercy of uh, Gamecock Nation. Jordan Stray, shit, I don't even know how to say dude's name. Jordan Strachan from Georgia State led. The nation in sacks, going to be a Gamecock this year, eligible immediately, should have made the list, honestly should have been in the top 10. So uh, that's the only one. Most of the feedback I've gotten has been pretty good on it, but uh, I have, Mm -hmm. hey, when I make a, when I miss one, (laughs) I own up to it. So Joey Freshwater, (laughs) loyal listener, Joey Freshwater was quick to correct me. So shout out to him for uh, letting me know that I left the guy off the list that I should have had on there. And Mike, are we are we really surprised? I mean, <laughs> don't you usually screw up on one of these guys? And in fact, when you put this list out and I saw Joey comment, I was like, oh, shit, here we go. <laughs> Let me go ahead and mute notifications for a little while so I don't get drug into this thing. No, I, I thought you did a fantastic. I, and, and well, hey, before starters, you go on, let me oh, say this, yeah. though, Shane, because a little behind the scenes, how these lists always work out. You know, I make the list, I make the graphics, I send it over to Shane and, and Cousin Jonathan. I say, how's this look? It takes them about six seconds to say, yep, it looks good to me. So they're my editors. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to put that one on you. To be fair, all right, if, if we're being completely honest here, 
I'm not looking at the actual names. I'm looking more at the color scheme. <laughs> John's looking for the spelling. That's it. <laughs> that is the extent of our review. So there was no way in the hell we were going to catch that name. I don't care how many sacks he had at Georgia Tech. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, uh, but anyway, Mike, I did appreciate the list. I, I love the pod. I got to listen to it this way, uh, this morning on the way to work. And, uh, and uh, it's list season, baby. I, this is the first one you've put, really put out in a while. And uh, I thought you did fantastic with it, man. I mean, that's what transfer – Transfer portal. I, I made the joke that Tennessee's portal you, and uh, because that's what we're doing, we're shopping. We're we're in the value bin, just looking for that cheap. You remember at Walmart they had them five dollar CDs. You know what I'm saying? You may not you may not watch the movie, but that's that's where we're at right now. And sometimes you find a gym down there. Sometimes you get a real good video you weren't expecting to play, and uh, so that's that's where we're at right now, Mike. So I appreciate the effort, and I thought. Full disclosure, I thought the the image itself, even though you missed the name, looked great. The scheme was fantastic. So, <laughs> Well, speaking of features, Shane, one that uh, we're having a lot of fun with, we've got a new call-in. That's right. From old Brad. Brad keeps calling. So, hey, if Brad wants to keep calling, we'll happily accept uh, his questions. But if anybody else wants to... Uh, use our call-in feature here. The off seasons are a great time to do that. And again, that number is uh, 615-800-5683. Let's kick it over to Brad from Kentucky. What's up, guys? It's Brad again. I uh, guess let's see if we can do this for a third time. What do you see as being the most likelihood for happening if the SEC were to change? I know the last team to join the SEC. I believe that was Missouri uh, that was the last to join. If you could, if the SEC were to add a team or if a team were to leave, who do you think would leave and who you would, who would you want to join the SEC? My money would be on trying to get Oklahoma in or say North Carolina State. But I also see why both of those would be unlikely. So let me know what you think would be realistic, but also what you think you would like to see. All right, Shane. So once again, we appreciate that one from Brad. So who you got? I mean, if if someone is going to leave the SEC, who do you think that would be? And who's a team that uh, you could see the SEC going after? You know, it's an interesting question, Mike. And I think it's one that we've kind of, touched on before just getting your thoughts i think the obvious two here mike you want one from the west you want one from the east now now the two that i'm looking at he mentioned oklahoma which is a good team it wouldn't be a i mean that would be a which would be a great add to the sec but i'm thinking rivals here mike i think this is a no-brainer you get the texas longhorns now they're playing a and m again now they're playing Arkansas again. I mean, it's just that's a that's an easy one. They are now the little brothers, okay? When they come over to the big boys' house, they they got to work their way up the dinner table because Texas A and M is going to smoke them until they can get their roster right. Now on the other side, you got to bring in Clemson, South Carolina. I mean, you're looking at the recruits; they're still from Georgia and Tennessee. No brainer for me. If years and if you were to go back four, five, ten years, I may have said something like Oklahoma and maybe Virginia Tech. But I think the day and age, where we're at right now, uh, I want Texas. I want I want Clemson. Those are my two teams, and I really think Mike, this is going to happen at some point. He asked, "Are we going to lose it?" I don't think we lose anybody. You know, I I, I think even teams like Vanderbilt putting all that money finally into their – I mean, they're finally taking athletics and uh, – uh, they're making it a priority, which mm-hmm. they should, you know. And But I do think at some point, especially when we start paying these players, that there's going to come a time that we we reshuffle this thing and we make power conferences, even though we kind of already have it. I think each conference we should have five of them, 
16 teams. It's going to make things really easy when we start talking ex- expansions and playoffs and things like that. I, I just see it happening at some point down the road. And if I were to pick two teams right now, I want Clemson. I want Texas. Now, if I can't get Clemson, because you got to think about it, it's more than just football. You know, you, you got to think of the other squads. There's some other good programs sitting out there. He, he made mention of North Carolina State. I would be a little bit more interested in actually North Carolina uh, would be an option. Oh, Shane, there. how many damn schools you, you've, already, you've already hit on a couple that I was going to say? <laughs> oh, okay. I'll stop, man. Okay. I'll just stop right now. I'm picking today two teams that we're adding. 16 seems like a sweet spot. Mm-hmm. I want Texas. I want Clemson. Who you got, Mike? Sorry. I could. I really, I could, I could play myself into seeing a lot more teams added, but who do you have? Well, I was going to say Texas. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> here's the thing. You know, I'm not trying to piss off the Aggies. I probably already did with that answer, but the SEC is just such a damn juggernaut that who are you going to really add that's going to bring a ton of value to the conference? Mm-hmm. There's very few that I think are capable of doing it and I think as much as we make the we like to make fun of the Longhorns that is a brand and an alumni base you know maybe they don't have the the track record of being a a very elite football program if we're being honest but I think the SEC would potentially get that elevate that program to that standard so right that to me is uh, one of the obvious candidates to add Mm-hmm. But if I can't get them, you hit on it there at the tail end of your spiel there. But uh, <laughs> North Carolina, I think, makes a ton of sense. You know, I don't know how realistic that would be with all their contracts to the ACC, but you'd be getting one of the most dominant basketball programs of all time. And yeah. and I, I think how you kind of got to look at it is, you know, for as much fan support as – Schools like South Carolina and Tennessee and, and even Georgia probably have in that state. You really don't have a, a footprint with one of the institutions in North Carolina. So uh, mm-hmm. that would make a ton of sense to me. And I wouldn't want an NC State or something like that. I mean, their their fan base is, is so small and, and pathetic. <laughs> I, if, I'm, <laughs> if I'm reaching someone, I'm the SEC. I want the big-time school from North Carolina or – uh, you know, the other big school from Texas, and I'm not settling for uh, – I don't want Clemson, Shane. You you can keep those orange bastards. We got the, the only orange and white we need in Tennessee, you know what? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the wolf pack. I mean, do you really want the wolf pack? I mean, come on. No, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> they haven't been relevant since Tory Holt. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm out on North Carolina State, uh, but I do like – I, I just right now. I mean, Virginia wouldn't be a, some, something up there. Virginia Tech. That's not a bad idea. The big picture here, Mike. Though I think if this were to happen, if we were to expand the SEC, mm-hmm. I don't know if we're going to have divisions, man. I, I think this is something where we readjust. There's or we 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 sit down and we think, okay, should Missouri really be in the East? You know what I'm saying? Should 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 Auburn be in the East or mm-hmm. something like that? I, I just think if we if we did add, and I think we're going to at some point, I they may even do away with the lines, maybe go to an eight, you know, 10 game SEC play. Um, because if, if, if what it's going to boil down to, Mike, when we start, like I said, when we start paying these guys, which we kind of are already, okay, uh, we're not going to get into that, but a lot of money goes to these athletes. But when we start having to pay the student athletes, We're going to have to sell tickets, man. And you can't do that playing games like Bowling Green on a Thursday. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) You're going to have to start playing SEC teams week in, week out. I just, that's what I see happening down the road here uh, and and expansions. And and of course, that's on down the road. I'm not going to try to get the cart too far in front of the horse here, but I I love talking the expansion because I think one more. I, we need two more in here just to make it a perfect number. 14 is not a good number. 16 is a good number for some reason. Mm-hmm. Well, hey, look at Shane, man, bringing the insight. I'm just the co-host on this one, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. But, hey, you're stepping all over the uh, next show topic, so let's just jump it right into it. Let's jump on down to Rocky Top. 
we'll get to the opener here. You just mentioned it. There's been an update, but really wanted to get your thoughts because we haven't had you on since uh, Henry Toa Toa jumped ship mm. to Alabama. What is the Tennessee Homer's reaction to Henry Toa Toa going to Alabama? That one hurt, Mike. It's not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. I, I was a Henry. I, anybody that knows me knows that I supported this kid, loved this kid ever since he stepped on camp. Right before he stepped on campus, man. I'm making videos. I, I don't know if you remember. I had the the little guy playing the guitar, and I was well, not a little guy, but you know the big guy <laughs> there in Hawaii playing the guitar. I was just so pumped up when Henry Che decided to come to university. I couldn't believe we landed him. And I said, you know. He's transferring, okay? And he was in and out, in and out, whatever. I get my hopes up. And then it got to a point I just didn't, you know, whatever. But I I, I was happy as long as he didn't go to three schools. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I sent a tweet out and saying this. There's 100, what, 30 teams in mm-hmm. college football. <laughs> just don't pick three of them. And he picked one of them. And it was the <laughs> University of Alabama. It's somebody we got to play. It's somebody that's dominant. And it's just another one. Butch Jones smoking a cigar in the locker room. I can see it already. And I'm not, I, I'm just, I'm not happy about the situation. I I want nothing best. I, I want the best for the kid. But I, if it, if I'm being honest, Mike, I don't think this was Henry's. I don't think this was his decision. I think this was his dad's decision. Mm-hmm. So, and, and it was a business decision. So I can't fault the kid for wanting to go to the NFL but you could have done that in, in, in any of the schools. You could have done that at Ohio State. You could have done that, you know, wherever else you wanted to go. But, yeah, freaking Alabama. So, yeah, that one hurt, man. That one really hurt. Yeah, and I hear you. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, man, he came to play for the former staff. And mm-hmm. they're not there anymore. And his connection to the schools kind of cut. And, and who knows, man, uh, there may be something behind the scenes here, which – Maybe he had to move on here. You know what I mean? So yeah. It, so I think there's I think there's that part of it as well uh, as Tennessee is currently going through an ongoing investigation. So it, it's just interesting how all the Brian Niedermeyer guys are are more or less moving on down the road. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, but the jokes, Mike. You know what I'm saying? The Charger <laughs> pictures, the McDonald's pictures. Uh, Vault Twitter was in rare form when this happened. I, I think I've seen more slant diagrams <laughs> than anything. So uh, I, I don't know, man. It's, it, it is what it is. That's the nature of this game. And there may, who knows? There, like you said, there may be something behind the scenes that it's better for both parties if they're not together. And if it's not, if it, it maybe it is NCAA related, but it may also be locker room related. You know, we got a new coach. We got a new staff. We got a new direction. And uh, if that's not mentioned in the locker room, we can't have that cancer in there. So mm-hmm. there could be a whole bunch of different things here. And it is what it is. It's the decision. The ink is dry. I just, like I said, it just hurt that he picked. I, I mean, he picked a rival the third Saturday in October. That's who he picked. He could have picked other SEC teams I would have been fine with. But it is what it is, Mike. You know, that's the nature of the beast. Now, let me ask you on a more positive note here. So this was the big news out of uh, Knoxville on Tuesday, but uh, Tennessee has moved the opener from Saturday, September 4th, still against Bowling Green, still in Neyland Stadium, but they've moved it to Thursday evening, September 2nd. So just two days sooner, the Josh Heupel era is going to start two days earlier. There's not going to be any other SEC games on. It's going to be broadcast nationally by the SEC Network. Thoughts on uh, Tennessee's decision to move up the opener a couple days? Well, my first, I mean, like I said earlier, the, my first, I, I was just thinking, man, we suck. You know, <laughs> we can't play on, we can't even play on Saturdays anymore, right? <laughs> but, but like you said, it's two days earlier, so uh, you know we're going to get to watch college football before anybody else, and. You know, we're going to have a larger party watching it because it is the start of the season. So, this is this is a great opportunity for Hop, man. Mm-hmm. This is a great opportunity to get out there, showcase this offense, crank it up, look fun. Because if you think about teams like Mississippi State last year, a lot of them, a lot of fans didn't watch any games past that LSU shellacking. And all they can think about is them beating the LSU Tigers, beating the the reigning national champs. 
so these first few games are very good for for perception, fan perception. And you may not watch any more games, but you may think of that little bowling green saying, man, you know, whatever happened to that team? They were they put up 50 points that night, you know, or something mm-hmm. like that. They can we can be fun. We can catch recruiting fire. Uh, I think it's uh, the the more I talk about it, the more I'm liking the two day earlier head start. Because if it was, let's be honest, Mike, if it was blended in Saturday with some of these other games that we got coming on, not a lot of eyes would be on that ball game. Yeah, and that's my thing right there. Uh, similar, unfortunately, it didn't happen because of uh, you know obviously the COVID stuff. But uh, Ole Miss was supposed to open. I can't remember if it was a Friday or a Sunday or something like that, but they were supposed to open the Lane Kiffin era against Baylor in a showcase game kind of like this. And, you know, this is a little bit different if maybe it's uh, Dan Mullen's Florida team right now or Nick Saban's mm-hmm. Alabama team. You know what you're getting with those guys. You know what you're getting with right. those teams. This is a completely different animal. I know it's, uh, you know, the local economy. I've seen some people – well, my God, this is terrible for business owners. And <laughs> and who wants to go, you know, it is an eight, I believe it's an eight o'clock kickoff Eastern time. So it is a, a night game and all that. I get it. But beyond those negatives here, which are minor, in my opinion, uh, you've got to get as many eyes as possible after some of the most dreadful offensive football I've ever seen in my life. Right. The last couple of years at Tennessee, you need to show people that that, that shit's over with. Yep. This is a new era. We're, we're fun and gunning. We're going to score 56. I bet Tennessee will probably score 60 points in this game. They'll probably <laughs> pile it on, you know, because they're probably going to be playing a couple quarterbacks, seeing what those guys got. And mm-hmm. uh, you better believe they're going to be touting this thing up and telling recruits to, to jump on and watch this game. And Tennessee's obviously going against all these other SEC programs in recruiting. And if you want to tell a recruit on Saturday – you know, morning check. How about you check out Tennessee Bowling Green when there's, uh, you know, Georgia and Clemson on at the same time. <laughs> what the hell are they going to watch? You know what I mean? So that, right. there's no negative here, in my opinion. I think this is a terrific move. And now that you're the you're the first SEC game of the entire season, it's going to screw up our countdown a little bit here. But, uh, <laughs> but man, I can't uh, I can't wait for it. And, and, hell, they moved it up two days. They can move it up two months for all I care. I'll, I'd be – locked in and ready to watch it absolutely and you remember the last time that these two teams got together it was the uh breakout of alvin Kamara. so maybe we'll have some young talent emerge in these games so uh wishful thinking i love it um obviously two more days earlier to watch college football i don't care which sec team it was i mean obviously i love the balls but either any sec team i would have been happy for so yeah i love it man All right, one other thing real quick before we get to our interview here with uh, Clark Brooks of SEC Stat Cat. Uh, Let's hop all day into Lexington real quick. Just wanted to make this note that uh, assistant coach Steve Klintscale, I can't say say that word, but however you say it, he left. (laughs) (laughs) Don't need to focus on that name anymore. (laughs) Defensive backs coach leaving for Michigan. And this is a key recruit here for, or excuse me, a key assistant for Mark Stoops' staff. You know, I'm, I'm not sitting here saying he's irreplaceable by any means, but uh, you look over, you know, in recent seasons, Kentucky's had some really good corners. Yusuf Corker is, is looking to be like one of the best safeties in the SEC this year. Yeah. Kelvin Joseph was just drafted. Mike Edwards plays for the Super Bowl champs. And he was instrumental in a lot of these Kentucky recruiting battles in this class, including the Wade twin, Shane, that uh, picked Kentucky yeah. over Tennessee. So uh, their key recruiter off of Kentucky staff. And Mark Stoops is going to have to find himself a new defensive backs coach. And I think this is complete speculation, but I, how about this name, Shane? I hope this happens. I don't think it will, but rumor on the streets, Ed Reed down there at Miami. I mean, my God, imagine if they could get Ed Reed to come up to Kentucky again. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think he's, you know, the leading candidate by any means, but uh, I did see Nick Roush of uh, Kentucky sports radio get kind of talking about it. So uh, Hmm. who knows, man, maybe, uh, maybe that's where Kentucky's at these days where they can pull a big name like Ed Reed. But that is where they're at, Mike, you know, that it feels to me like Kentucky's in this transition window 
And they can go one of two ways. They can go back to being irrelevant or they, I mean, they're already at the top. I mean, they can really take a step forward and you do that by recruiting. You do that by rolling out a new offense and being exciting. And, and uh, I think Kentucky's got a lot of great pieces up there. So I want to ask you, because this is, I mean, say what you want. The kid could recruit and he's gone now. Mm-hmm. Do we look back here in about five or six months saying, man, that was, that was some serious news or, or, or was it not? You know what I'm saying? Is, is this him leaving right now? Is, are we going to look back and say, man, that really hurt Kentucky because he is an ace recruiter? Yeah, I think potentially it really could be. And uh, the main reason, aside from you know being a really good coach, a really good recruiter, is just the timing of it. And yeah. you know all the staffs around the country, aside from Kansas, who just hired a coach, are filled up. So uh, you know this is kind of a, a domino effect from – how it happened was was Buffalo just hired, uh, or no, excuse me, Kansas hired the Buffalo coach, and mm-hmm. then Buffalo had to hire someone from Michigan staff, and now Michigan stole this guy from Kentucky. So that's kind of the domino effect. So naturally, Kentucky is going to have to continue this domino going, and and that'll be either by promoting from within, which may be the best option, or uh, maybe going down to the G five level because. It's just not an ideal time to find an assistant coach to come in to right. the meat grinder that is the SEC. Uh, and, and hell, we're about to break open recruiting wide open starting June exactly. 1st. So, uh, yeah, this this could be you know a lot bigger news than, uh, than people are probably realizing at the moment. Exactly, man. You're trying to convince these kids to come up, check you out on campus, and if you worked really hard on those those relationships all season last year, and then all of a sudden that that is gone, you know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, this isn't Mark's first rodeo, but one thing about Kentucky is they they've been really good at holding their staff together, and I just I don't know. It's just I'm afraid we're going to look back at this and say, damn, you know that was a that was like you said, terrible timing, because the next hire they bring in is it's it's not. I don't think it's going to be unless you get somebody like a Reed or something like that. Maybe that's Maybe that we look back and we say, "Damn, this was a great thing." <laughs> <You know? laughs> right, but, right. But uh, it's it, it's a tough, it's a tall order here. Late May, trying to find a, a, an assistant coach. Mm-hmm. All right, Shane. Hey, we spieled on long enough here. Let's get to our interview with Clark Brooks, aka SCC Statcat. Hey, we're pleased now to welcome back to the show Clark Brooks, better known as SCC Statcat. He's, I, for my money, he's the best follow on Twitter. Go to his website, secstatcat.com. Clark, thanks for joining me once again. I really appreciate you. Mike, looking forward to talking to you again. It's been a while. Yeah, and uh, I got to be honest, man, you're one of the few guests here we can spiel on before we even get to the recording. So that's how I know <laughs> you're fired up to be here, fired up to drop some knowledge. I really do appreciate it. And one thing that I'm seeing, like I said, at sec underscore statcat, if you're not following Clark already, you're doing your life wrong here. But he is jumping on just about anybody that is not aware just how great Chris Rodriguez has been for Kentucky's offense in recent seasons. Can you explain to the folks why you're so high on Chris Rodriguez and and why it seems like you have a, a vendetta against anybody that uh, speaks ill of Kentucky's star running back? Well, I mean, I don't know if it's just the Kentucky, you know, aura around him. Oh, it's just Kentucky football. We don't have to pay any attention to him. But for as much acclaim and love as Benny Snell got a few years ago, this kid is like a ghost in comparison. Benny Snell, as many yards as he gained, he was not an efficient running back. Sure, it helped UK grind it out and maybe win some ball games. But, you know, from where I sit, why not like the more efficient option? Well, Looking at Mr. Rodriguez, he only was situationally successful on two-thirds of his carries last season. You know the next closest running back with at least 50 carries got? 54.9%. So about 12% higher than the next closest guy. He's head and shoulders above everyone else. Number one in the nation in first down touchdown rate. Um, he was sixth in, uh, amongst the volume guys in broken tackle rate. And, of course, anyone can follow good blocking. But what I like to look at when we separate rushers is what can they do after engagement? Anybody can run to open space. 
not everyone can make a guy miss in the hole or, or, you know, beat a guy around the edge and get yards after that. So that is one area where you really like where he, what he brings to the table because guess what? Led the SEC with a 4.2 clip. Insane. It was a, a 0.4 yard higher than the next guy. Oh, look again. He's so much on his own level in terms of the things you want. No, he doesn't break tackles like Tanks Bigsby last season, but he still gets the yards after contact, and he makes those plays matter. And even though he's not the fastest guy, Mike, I mean, who doesn't want a back that always falls forward and keeps you ahead of the chains? I mean, to, for me, who likes to pass the ball, that is the, what I want out of my running game. I want to continuously not – I don't want to move backwards, I want to continuously fall forward, and when I give you these limited chances, you better well help us move the chains or sustain drives. And he did all that with uh, an anemic passing game, you know, to boot. So, I mean, how bad was Kentucky's passing attack last year, according to your data? Uh, well, according to my data, anyone's data, the, the, you know, uh, the traditional metrics, my <laughs> metrics, whatever you look at, they were one of the worst in the Power Five. There's just no getting around it. They were absolutely terrible. Um Eddie Grant was absolutely handcuffed. In my opinion, I think Terry Wilson was a little bit more of a, a gun-shy passer. He had to be goaded to take chances downfield. Same time, it's not like he had any guys he could really trust. Um, so in addition to the, the stale scheme, the iffy quarterback play, and just, just damn well no one to throw the ball to, of course, that's the result you've got. Um, moving forward, I would like to see, obviously, there's going to be a lot of emphasis in the uh, Big Blue Nation, they are going to hear the phrase marriage between the run and the pass. So it's setting up the outside zone and using the play action boots, kind of like what you're seeing from Cleveland, from the LA Rams, especially because that's where Liam Combs, the new offensive coordinator, is coming from. So it's going to be a little bit more balanced. You would like to think a little bit more quarterback friendly in that sense where, you know, you're, it, you're not going to be so obvious, you know, the tendencies of Kentucky. Oh, okay, it's second and 10. They're either going to run a counter or a screen or, you know, something a little dinky and dunky where they have no ability to stretch the field. Well, this time you can do play action shots off these outside zones and really sucker in people because they're a little bit more diagnosable um, from the defensive side as opposed to, um, you know, a gap play that can maybe take an extra beat to develop zones. Everybody's moving the same way. So um, as effective as it is, it still, you know, tips the hand. And, of course, Alabama had a lot of success running a lot of different play actions this past season. So um, even though there is a lot of potential in terms of, you know, there's nowhere they can go down, it's only going to go up, I'm just – I'm a little bit apprehensive to say how much better it can be because, again, they have a lot of questions at the quarterback position. Wondell Robson, fantastic addition. It would have been even better if he originally committed to years. But here's the thing. This offense has had, you know, like I said, a very deplorable group of receivers who just cannot win one-on-one. -on -one. They're not necessarily fast. UK's best passing offense in the last decade was in 2016. And what did that group have? Besides a competent quarterback, they had two fast receivers that could beat guys one-on-one -on -one in Juice Johnson and Jeff Bidette. So they have this advantage once again. And like I said, when you have someone like Chris Rodriguez to really take the attention of the defense and you have the speed that can beat guys one-on-one, -on -one, the big plays can follow. But with the questions at the quarterback position with Bo Allen, with Joey Gatewood, who when he came in, when he was at Auburn, he was a glorified wildcat option. Nothing more. That's a hard guy to try and mold into a pro-style passer. So Will Tevis is also going to be in the discussion. But since he's enrolling so late, you know, he, he was not here during the spring. Um, I'm just really questioning his, his ability to grasp the offense and then lead this unit um, of guys he's known for basically two months. So, um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of concerns there, but I think it's going to head in the right direction overall. Now, you mentioned uh, Wandale Robinson there. I believe it was Barrett Salee of CBS Sports saying, Heisman buzz for old Wandale. I mean, are we putting the cart before the horse here? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on – on that uh that's yeah that, i think the piece was labeled an overreaction and i think that is definitely a fitting title for that take um he's going to be a, a gadget back so i would love i don't know if this is going to happen because uk didn't have a spring and they kind of barred media away so we really don't know what they're going to do tactically but i would love if they um instituted more pre-snap motion kind of like alabama did last year 
And Wandell, Robin, Wandell is that type of player to do that. So quick jet motion where, you know, um, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, before the ball is snapped, they're racing in front of the quarterbacks, face laterally orbit motion where they loop around the backfield. Um, so those types of tactics are, are starting to get a little bit more popular. They're trying to tip defenses pre-snap into their, where they're going to rotate single high or stay in too deep. And, of course, that will trigger quarterback reads and make it a little bit more friendly. But if you don't have that speed to tilt the people, you know, it's, it's not an effective tactic. He is that type of player who you have to watch every snap, kind of like Lynn Bowden was. And I kind of <laughs> – I would have loved to see them two in the same team, but, of course, he originally went to Nebraska, and they kind of bummed out the, BT, the BBN. But, yes, he is that type of player where, um, along with Chris Rodriguez, you have to absolutely watch every snap. Um, now, the terms of volume he'll receive – I highly doubt he would be up for the uh, up for the award, even if Kentucky went undefeated to get him into that you know threshold there. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, it's just because they have so little weapons already on the roster, he's bound to make an in- impact no matter how he's used. Now, do you have confidence that uh, Kentucky's got a third receiver that could step up be uh, behind Robinson and of course Josh Ali? Um, not at the moment. You know, Michael Drennan gets some some buzz. I was high on Clavon Thomas, but of course he he hurt his ACL in spring practice. So um, Tay-Tay Coons could be another guy to watch. But, yeah, there's really not anybody I've seen that I'm like, oh, gosh, you know, that guy's going to be good um, in game action just because, you know, it's really hard for them to stand out in that uh, that previous offense when they were basically blocking the entire time. Now, how do you handicap the uh, quarterback competition at Lexington? You may have tipped your hand a little bit there with uh, your Joey Gatewood comments, but uh, is Bo Allen a better fit for this? Or, or do you think it's Will Levis potentially? Gosh, it's so it's so weird. I, you know, it, it could really be any one of these guys at the moment. Bo Allen, when he originally committed, he was like Mac Jones, thick. He was skinny. He needed to put on weight. You could tell when he was throwing last year, his arm just was not there. Um, even seeing the limited clips and on that spring special that ran on the SEC Network, um, his low release worries me for a short guy. He's only about six one, six two, real height. So that could lead to a lot of batted balls, and that could lead to turnovers and drive killers. So that worries me. Joey Gatewood looks the part. He looks like, you know, if you were to dream up a quarterback and mold him out of clay, you would get Joey Gatewood. Problem is, he can't really throw the ball that well. So um, if Kentucky is still going to try and do some read option stuff as opposed to doing more under center pistol stuff like I was talking about earlier, um, absolutely Joey Gatewood could be that short-term option. I think the Penn State transfer probably will be the better passer. But, again, I'm just so, you know – I wouldn't say untrusting, but I just don't – I don't feel entirely comfortable handing the keys of the program over to this guy um, who has been on campus for so little because, you know, regard, I know Mark Stoops' job is safe, but let's be honest, back-to-back losing season isn't ideal. Mm-hmm. Now, moving on from – well, no, last thing on Kentucky because I want to ask you this. Who, in your opinion, who's Kentucky's uh, biggest rival right now in the SEC? Uh, you know, I would say Florida. Um, traditionally, obviously, it's been Tennessee, but it's, it's obviously a very one-sided affair. And even though um, they definitely got their joy kicking Tennessee's ass last year in Knoxville <laughs> for the first time in a very, very long time, and getting a, and helping getting a coach fired at halftime, mm-hmm. so I'm sure I'm sure the BBN loved that. But at the same time, I think they view themselves as Florida as the bigger um, modern rivalry because the games have been more competitive. The games have mattered more in the standings. Um, Kentucky could be a dark horse for the SEC East this year. Of course, they're going to have to go through Florida, and uh, Florida could be vulnerable with a brand-new quarterback. Uh, Well, thanks, Clark. You just lost us our entire Tennessee audience. Kentucky has uh, jumped past Tennessee on the floor, and I I can't argue with you on that one. I mean, look, from a Kentucky perspective, it's a very one-sided rivalry. I mean, I get you guys would love, love to have like a whipping boy and someone you can always count on winning, but um, I don't know. Just the games I look forward towards more in terms of like charting and like what seems what matters between the two teams is definitely Florida and Kentucky. I don't know if it's just because the game happens earlier in the year, but for whatever reasons, the last three or four seasons, um, last year excluded. Kentucky has looked flat playing Tennessee. Like, even the year where they had uh, Josh Allen and Benny Snell at his peak, they went down to Knoxville and just looked completely dead in the water, and they let Jaron Garantano beat them back-to-back years. Mm-hmm. So, um, 
even though it definitely does sting Kentucky fans for them to lose to Tennessee, I think the Florida games are viewed as a little bit more fiery these days for whatever reason. Well, speaking of Florida, Emory Jones was in the news here because uh, I believe his pro football focus had him as a projected number six overall pick in the 2022 NFL mock draft. And that's this is why I say you got to follow SEC Stat Cat on Twitter because while other people got these hot takes, you dropped some uh, knowledge and data after that. So what was your thoughts on Emory Jones being projected as a top 10 pick? Um, look, that's the way the NFL is going. They're really focusing on athletes who can extend plays with their legs and make these wow throws. But here's the thing with Emory Jones. He has not shown the ability to, com- to throw the ball accurately downfield. His depth-adjusted accuracy – was about 36% the last two seasons, which is not good. You want that thing around 50 to 55% for a, a pretty good quarterback. Great quarterbacks will be in the 60s. So if you're below 40% and, you know, you, you're you basically running plays that are packaged especially for you to uh, take advantage of the defense when they're suckered in, um, it's not the best look. Now, I think with extended reps, I think the offense is going to be a lot better this year. And I don't think – He's going to be that inaccurate moving forward. I think definitely Dan Mullen's going to put him in situations to succeed because, after all, he's elite running the ball. He was basically top five across the board in every efficiency metric. And, of course, I know it's easier for quarterbacks to run the ball because the, the, you gain that additional blocker in the, you know, in the Q run game. And if you run counters, you bring that extra body. It really gets fun. And then when you do these bubble screens that really test flank defenders from crashing in, then it gets extra fun. And, of course, Florida does all of that. So, yeah, I think he's absolutely going to be effective. It's just a matter of I know pro scouts are going to want to see him perform in the drop back game. Mm-hmm. I have not been able to see him do that, and that's where I have questions, even though he is absolutely um, very equipped to succeed this season and help Florida contend for an SEC title. Now, I really wanted to ask you about uh, LSU's quarterback competition. Of course, uh, T.J. Finley's hit the transfer portal, and Coach O has come out here on Tuesday and said, you know, this is a thing between Miles Brennan and Max Johnson, like I, I assume we all believed it was before. But uh, based on your data, who would you go with between Miles Brennan and Max Johnson? Because I think the, the answer here for LSU could really dictate how good of a season they have. Yeah, I mean, they're two different style quarterbacks. Miles Brennan, um, he definitely likes to press the ball a little bit further downfield off play action. Johnson wants to move more laterally. But here's the thing, Miles Brennan, number one in accuracy, number one in depth-adjusted accuracy last season in the SEC, even better than Mac Jones and Felipe Frank. So Hmm. keep that in mind. Um, He is going to be one of the better pinpoint guys. And, of course, um, you know, as much as LSU stretched the field under um, Joe Brady, and, of course, they're trying to run that stuff back this year, bringing back Pete and Mangus. So they're going to do a little bit more – Um, run and shoot type of tactics underneath stuff and of course you need to be on rhythm with pinpoint accuracy with precision now max johnson he's not a slouch in this regard but it just looks like miles brennan is just further along in that respect plus he already has a leg up because he knows the offense a little bit you know he has a little bit more experience with this offense so i think i mean Obviously, I can go into the different things whether you know deep passing intermediate drop back off play action pressured Basically, Brennan has the edge or they're dead even. So um, now looking at um, Johnson's accuracy, so if I were to just drop Brennan's, he was 47.4% on deep accuracy. Johnson's 42.7. So just, you know, 5% off. And, of course, that could be about a completion or two um, a game depending on the volume. So, and of course, explosive plays are very correlated to wins and losses. And um, – I just think Brennan is the better suited person to take advantage of when defense is finally tired of rallying to these underneath passes that he can definitely uh, make them pay over top. All right, one uh, offense I really wanted to ask you about, and in particular their starting quarterback here, Eli Drakowicz going into year two at Missouri. What are your thoughts on the, on his what he's bringing to uh, Columbia there? And, and really the guy that I'm just having – such a hard time evaluating is Connor Basilak. Some people love him. Some people, well, I'd say most people love him. And, and I'm just trying to scratch my head at uh, what, what they're seeing that, that suggests he's one of the best quarterbacks in the SEC. 
Yeah, he still has issues um, delivering an accurate ball downfield, and that's going to be a problem. But, look, here's the thing. That was just his first season of extended action. He's going to be a third-year sophomore this year. He was learning a brand-new offense. So um, he definitely has the, quote-unquote, game manager label at this point in time. And it doesn't help him that Missouri's favorite pass pattern was curl flats, which is just synonymous with conservative passing. So um, it's, you know, nine-yard curls and everyone else running a, a one-yard flat. So it's not stretching the defense vertically at all. So um, it's not a um, an offense that really required him to deliver pinpoint precision, just like I was talking about. LSU is completely different offense. It's trying to razzmatazz you with outside zones and lots of wrinkles off of it, play actions off of it. Um, I kind of like how I like Kentucky might play. Missouri runs a little bit more, you know, modern stuff. Of course, they do triple options and stuff off that, a little bit more spread than what I expect out of Kentucky. But it's basically the same stuff I was talking about earlier. So um, he's definitely got to show up that he can throw the ball accurately downfield, beyond 10 yards downfield. Like I was just talking about um, the two LSU quarterbacks, both over 40%, pretty good. But Miles Brennan was just a little bit better. Base lack 25%. Only a quarter of his deep passes were on the money. So if his guys are always going to have to adjust to his passes, that is not necessarily great for long-term success. The result-based metrics kind of like him. He's, he was top 35 in EPA per play. But uh, you know EPA can be kind of fraudulent. Like I said, it's more team-based than player-based, kind of like success rate. So that's why I like to definitely look at the process best teams with quarterbacks. So like accuracy, where is he, where is he placing the ball? How far is he throwing the ball down? So stuff like that. Now, I wanted to talk about uh, one of your recent articles that, again, you can find at secstatcat.com. I don't want you to have to give away the entire information here, but uh, the article I'm talking about, four offensive SEC trends and three offensive concepts that I like. That's the title of the piece. But uh, what I specifically wanted to ask you about, and the listeners can check out the, the full article, again, at secstatcat.com, but early down passing and why that's critical to success in college football. What can you tell us about that? So the average pass gains more than the average run. And the sooner you buy into that philosophy, the more yards in theory you're going to gain and and put you in positions to score points. It's that simple. So obviously a lot of teams like to ease into things. It's a physical game. You want to get the pad popping. You want to get the blood flowing. That's normal. But at the same time, if you're trying to win the game, you want to go for the plays that are a little bit more efficient. So um, early, early down passing is increasing in the SEC. Now, what do I mean by that? By early, early, well, that means starting games passing. You're not waiting to the second quarter, third quarter to start passing on first down, so you have a deficit. This is in your game plan. Well, that is on the rise in the SEC, and you might be saying, well, not so fast, Clark. Well, duh, the air rate hit the SEC, so passing is naturally going to be up. Well, if I were to exclude the air rate at Mississippi State, it still is trending upward. So um, it remains to be seen because we still have a, we have a, a, a numerous amount of new offensive coordinators and offensive minds in the SEC. So um, that could definitely change. But I love that at least for the last little bit, it is trending that way because naturally I like to chart efficient offenses. I don't like to chart 90 plays of three-yard runs. That's not fun. I'm, I'd much rather um, study the designs of plays that go for 60, 70, 80 yards, more so than, you know, eight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last thing for you, Clark. This is uh, kind of a hot topic this offseason. Two of the perceived to be best quarterbacks in the SEC returning, Matt Corral, JT Daniels. You talked about that also at secstatcat.com. And before we get rolling here, I just want to admit – Man, you were dead on, dead on this time last year. I had you on the show. I still am a big John Rice Plumley guy, but you said doesn't make any sense. Matt Corral fits what Lane Kiffin wants to do, and, and damn, you nailed that one. So uh, I really trust your opinion on this, but what can you tell us, Matt Corral versus JT Daniels, which one is, uh, is the better quarterback in your mind? Oh, it is very, 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 very close, but one – factor and i hate to sound like a broken record but it's just coming up you know just ever so naturally it's deep passing that is what's separating the two daniels even though his dudes are coming down with a, a great number of uh deep passes his accuracy has been crappy um his depth adjusted actually is bottom three his 
other act, his just raw accuracy um, is fairly middle of the road for that reason. If we were to just look at throws beyond the line of scrimmage, but tw- uh, 19 yards in, these guys have a basically the exact same resume. So that is really the only thing that's separating them besides like situational split. So like if you were to look at third down or pressured passing, it's really close. Basically, the only things that are separating them are, you know, drops and little things like that are that are situational. Their result based metrics are really, 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 really close. Now, all encompassingly, because of um, Georgia's, let's just say, aggressiveness and Todd Monken's philosophy, it's a little bit more vertical passing than in years past. No one has a higher deep passing rate than JT Daniels. So that's obviously going to skew his numbers a little bit. So, like I said, if he's not accurate and he's going to do this a whole lot, well, his whole sample is basically going to be, um, you know, soured a little bit. Mm-hmm. So you got to keep that in mind when you look at the numbers. But as of right now, based on having Lane Kiffin in his corner and having more continuity and being, I think, the more accurate downfield thrower. Spoiler alert, Matt Corral is my QB1 for 2021. All right, he's Clark Brooks, a.k.a. SEC StatCat. Got to give him a follow, and I've linked uh, his articles. You can find that in the show notes. You got to check out the website, secstatcat.com. Clark, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. There's some outstanding insight. Love talking with you, Mike. Have a good one. All right, Shane, so how about that? Clark Brooks dropping the knowledge, talking some SEC football. I think fans are really going to appreciate that one. Golly, Mike, what a, I mean, that, what a load of information that was. That was I, I always love having him on. It, it just, it, I, I just you know, sometimes you listen to some guys, and you're like, man, they're just old. They're really smart. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> they're a lot smarter than me. <laughs> so it's like me watching Jeopardy, you know, and I get like two answers right. So, <laughs> but anyway, I, I no, I really thought that was great. I appreciate him taking the time. I appreciate you getting him on. Uh, because he always has great information, and, it's, it, and I don't know. I always like to look back at these and, and say, you know, at the end of the season, how close were those stats? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right, and, uh, you know, like I hit on, on the interview, remember it was this time last year I was talking up John Rice Plumley, and mm-hmm. uh, old Clark came on the show and said, you're looking at the wrong guy, man. It's Matt Corral all the way, and he really nailed that one. So. Absolutely. I mean, I, he's got so much information and, and, you know, what I really like about uh, him and, and there's other guys that do it as well, but uh, you know, there's, there's data to what they're saying instead of just spieling and, right. and throwing out crazy nonsense, like, uh, like we've been known to do, but <laughs> <laughs> they, they actually do the work and, uh, I, and I think it just makes a, makes the info just that much more valuable. Absolutely, man. Well, hey, buddy, uh, I think that's all we got on this one. You got anything before we hop off here? Uh, no, I, I will say, Mike, uh, we we're talking about it a little bit before and after and during the show here. I really like this call thing. Uh, it's starting to grow on me, and uh, I think it's going to be really awesome when the season ends or when the season begins. Mm-hmm. You know, some of those tough break losses, we've all been there. I'm even going to call in. First thing I want to do, man, after we – after we upset Alabama and Henry and Henry T's not smoking a cigar, mm-hmm. I'm going to get on there. I'm going to ramble for about a good five minutes. Probably going to be drunk as shit, you know, but it's going to be well worth it. But we also know depressing Shane's going to get on there every now and then too. So I just, I, I don't know. I just take advantage of it. And it is the off season. We're not going to be able to answer a lot of questions during season because there's just going to be so much information to get into. Mm -hmm. But during the off season, if you got questions, even if you think they're stupid, they're not call us at 615-800. I figured this out, Mike, the number, the last four is five, six, eight, three. That spells love. (laughs) (laughs) So you, I may see these on the stall somewhere there in Nashville. So it's six one eight hundred love. You cannot forget that number. Call in, get us some questions. Get this. Let's get this party started. It's list season, baby, and it's your season. We do this podcast for you guys, so we'd love to answer any questions that you have. Hey, absolutely, Shay. That's a that's a great note to to go out on. And uh, you know, as always, like we like to say, give us that five star written review. If you haven't already, we've got the Missouri and Vandy koozies on the way. So 
We got all 14 SEC teams covered. And don't forget, uh, you know, we're really trying to grow this YouTube page as well. That SEC podcast on YouTube, that's really starting to take off. And we're going to have video content coming this yep. season. So uh, really trying to get that thing up and going. I, there's nothing worse than spending uh, 10 hours on a video and getting two views on it. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to avoid that as, as much as I possibly can. Oh, man, we're going to be so active, too, on the video platform this year. Uh, we're really looking forward to that. Going to have a countdown. Going to do a whole bunch of cool stuff. Uh, you know, so just hang in there. Uh, we're growing with you, and uh, appreciate you hanging out with us here in the May. And, Mike, I appreciate all the effort, man. Getting out here, getting some of these great interviews, great information. I mean, who knew these little nuggets of, of info were sitting out there in May? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, man, I I live for it, brother, so that's why I'm doing it. So <laughs> I appreciate you. I appreciate uh, all the listeners for hanging out. And uh, we just passed a million downloads, so that was a big milestone for us, and, and we're happy to be here for the next million. But, uh, hey, that's all I got, brother. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks, thank you, Shane, for hanging out. Catch you on the next one. All right. <laughs> See you guys. Go Vols. All right, you ready? <laughs> yeah, man. I'm ready. I'm ready to open this cold beer. Hey, what's our number? Oh, it's 888 what? No, it's uh, 615. Oh, that's way off. Okay, 615. Uh-huh. 800. Okay. 5683. 5683. I'm just wondering if we can make a word out of that, you know? 5683. Oh, love. <laughs> really? Yeah, 56. L O V E. I sound I don't know if we could roll with that though. I mean, that's we're pretty, SEC. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean Yeah. <laughs> God, I say J O it could be J O T E Jote Jove. Um yeah, no, I mean, love, that's it. 800 love, <laughs> ain't that something? <laughs> yeah.